What is going on everybody? Fu over here, back with a brand new episode of Yume Meko When They Cry. Last time on, we were finally introduced to the Oshiro Mira uh, family, which is a very witch aristatic type of family. As we're introduced to our main character, Battler, as he joins with his close family members to go to Wokenjima Island, which the family, family always goes to once a year in order to have their annual meeting. And besides that, we haven't really had much has happened. We've just been introduced to a ton of characters, like a ton of characters. Uh, you guys have informed me of, um, I should always check out the character selection screen as there is a ton of information about the characters. And also that I should switch to the Witch Hunt uh, translation, which I did, which is why my playtime is 37 minutes instead of 2 hours, is because I had to replay for the entire section of last time. My fingers burned after that. <laughs> but it's all, it's all good for the best possible translation I can have. So let's go check out the character section. Alright, let's go check out Jessica. Cross and Natsu Natsushi's daughter, in the absence of any regardies, it is thought that she will eventually inherit the readership of the Oshiro's o <clears throat> Oshiro Mira family, or rather her husband will. However, she seems to have no interest in all this. Born with weak banshi and sometimes assaulted by sudden asthma attacks. Interesting. Eva, Kinzo's second child, hostile towards her brother, Kwas, and opposes him in almost everything from issues dealing with the family fortune to the question of who will succeed the family headship. Normally, she would have lost her place in the Ushu Romira register upon her marriage, but she managed to forcibly overcome this by having her husband take her family name. Oh, okay. Hideyoshi, Eva's husband, took his wife's name upon their marriage and was welcomed into the Ushu Ro Ushi -wo <clears throat> Ushiro Mira family, therefore he does not possess the spiteful Ushiro Ma genes, and his bright smile is very refreshing at the family conferences. He started his business from scratch and now works as the president of a company operating medium sized restaurant change. Apparently business is soaring and things are going extremely well. He's gonna die. <laughs> George, even Hideyoshi's son, an affable young man liked by everyone in the family. He is currently studying as an assistant for his father's company and seems he dreams of making it on his own one day. The oldest of the four cousins, he acts as their leader and arbiter. We got Rudolph, Kenzo's third child. Along with his sister Eva, he tends to make his voice heard during the family conference and prevent their elder sibling, Qualls, from keeping all of their father's wealth for himself. Okay. Was's former wife, Asumu, Asumu, six years ago, and married his current wife, Kire, straight after that. Rudolph's second wife, they had been business partners for a considerable length of time before the passing of his first wife, at which time she overtook took the position. Served as Rudolph's right hand in several shady pieces of business, guiding them to success. success. Quick thinking, deeply trusted by her husband. Okay, so they knew each other before the wife passed away. Hmm. It's something. The son of Rudolph and his first wife, Asumu, turned against his father six years ago when he married a second wife immediately after Asumu passed on. Ooh, yeah, that might... Immediately after your wife passes? Jeez. He went to live with his grandparents on his mother's side. However, both of these grandparents passed away, and he has now returned to the Ushu... Woma... Ushi... <clears throat> it's gonna take a while for me to get used to it, folks. Alright, deal with it. Ushiro Mira family after six years. This family confluence is his chance for him to renew his friendship with his cousins after a six year gap. Rosa, Kenzo's fourth child, by far the youngest of the four siblings, it seems that this gives her a weaker position at the family conference. She manages to design a comp manages a design company, but she has yet to start fake taking it seriously, and his financial situation is far from favorable. Maria, Rosa's daughter, her father's identity is unknown. Ooh. She can't shake off the habit of speaking like a young child, which often earns her a scolding. She has no interest in studying or making friends, but is very interested in things concerning the occult and black magic. <laughs> I sure hope that doesn't bite us in the ass. And thanks to her excellent powers of memoization, she knows all kinds of obscure trivia. Kainan, a young servant, performs his duties silently and diligently, but due to his unsociable nature, he's not so 
Hyde we regard as a servant. There are several other servants with the On character in their pseudonyms. He and Shannon just happen to be the ones on duty that day. Oh. Goda, servant employed as a chef. While he has, hasn't served the family long, he has a polished talent for entertaining guests, cultivating through his previous jobs, and is highly regarded as a servant. Since he was hired by Quas and his wife, he is more trusted than those servants who have served the family longer and who are thought of, of as Kinzo's spies. Oh. Okay. This elderly woman is a part-timer who has served the family for a great many years, despite quitting her job several times along the way. Shrewd and more than competent when it comes to performing their duties, but because of her chattiness and love of rumors, she's not highly regarded as a servant. Okay. So we got some we got something very interesting. So who was it? Uh, da, 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 da. Quas. Okay, so Quas is the first child who's most likely in line to gain all the money from Kinzo. So they're gonna to try to stop that. This is very um I don't know, very medieval. I have to say in terms of like, oh who's well, I guess that's just every witch family, isn't it? <laughs> it's always bickering about who gets the damn will from the grandfather. But anyway, let's finally get into it. Oh, actually, one more thing. There is a tip section. Well, there's a grimoire. Uh, oh my god. Okay. Oh, <laughs> okay. Words from family. Okay, yeah. Number one is Jessica's speech. Traditionally, perhaps speak differently in the difference in much more than years. Jessica's speech is masculine, blunt, casual, and assertive in chapter. Tori is a sentimental entry gate to a Shinto shrine. It is usually read in as a very recognized and portable square shape. Yeah, okay. Okay, so these are just pretty much just just Japanese uh, things uh, in detail. Okay. <clears throat> As we gathered in the room assigned to us cousins, George Aniki asked us to excuse him for a second. He rushed over to Kumasawa-san, who was following behind the disappearing adults, and seemed to ask her something. He soon finished his business and came back. どうしたんだよ、兄貴。ああ、何でもないよ。ちょっと聞きたいことがあっただけさ。マリアに向けて。マリアに向けて。うーん。何かな。ジョージ兄さんが私に聞かなくて、熊沢さんには聞くことって。
I, I thought about this last episode, but I never mentioned it. Jessica is very much like me on in so many aspects of, you know, first tomboy type personality, inheriting the will to actually the next heir to the fucking family fortune and all that. I say Ryukushi 07 has a uh, archetype he likes to play around with. <laughs> そういうのがいたら挨拶したいってそういうことらしいぜ。おお。挨拶する。マリアも挨拶する。なんだよそれ。全然やましくねえじゃねえかよ、兄貴。うん。違うな。マリア、騙されるな。兄貴は何か隠
むしろ逆で遊んでていいぞっていうのか<笑>あいつそういうのだけは素直に聞きやがるぜ秀吉兄さんのところは受験本当にうまくいったじゃないですかぜひ子供操縦術の秘訣を教えてくださいようーんそうやな何のために勉強するのかっちゅうことを問いたかもしれんな個々の勉強に意味があるわけやないにゃそう勉強っちゅうのは分からんことを自分で調べて身につけるという行為の練習なんやこれができんやつは社会に出ても使い物にならん国語算数ができると言ってるんやない勉強し身につけることを学べっちゅうことやなご立派ですわうちのジェシカにもそれが理解できればいいんだけど今のままではとてもじゃないけど後宮家の跡取りとしてはいいじゃないの無理に跡取りにしなくても女には女の幸せというものもあるんだしそれを親が押し付けちゃ悪いわよ予算買えば子供の育て方は家それぞれや押し付けがましいのはあかんでごめんなさい夏日姉さんも気を悪くしないでね Though through the light shining in through the window was quite warm despite the cloudy weather, there was a dark mood about the room, which was probably causing headaches for more than just Natsushi. As if to sweep away that mood, Kirei brightly made a suggestion to all present. キリエ姉さんはお詳しいですね。買ってきた甲斐がありました。キューエンウォーズは、ストップするシーツを見つけたので、ブラックティーを作っお二人ともありがとう。それは後でいただきましょう。うちの者がすぐお茶を持ってきますので、どうぞおくつろぎください。二人とも後にしろよ。ウェルカムドリンクくらい、ごちそうになろうぜ。Rudolph gave a subtle signal with his eyes for them to sit down again. Kyrie and Woza understood instantly and obediently turned to their seats. The initial greeting of the guests was complete, so it was time for them to be served some tea. It was embarrassing for the host that the tea was white, especially now that the guests were talking about making tea themselves. Natsushi bit her lower whip, frustrated by the importude of the servants who were late bringing in the tea. Seeing her face, Eva immediately started to Google. Of course, Shannon had no way of knowing what was taking place in the parlor. She came pushing a servant cart piled with teacups. For no apparent reason, Natsushi gave her a pained look, but she, and Shannon couldn't help but flinch without knowing what she had done wrong. Oh, Shannon chan! She apologized like a small flying animal, bumped against the serving cart, and made a jarring racket as she dropped several teaspoons. The clumsiness made Natsushi's expression turn even darker, which made Shannon quail even more. いいのよ、夏日姉さん。挨拶の一つくらいしたってどうってことないわよ。もう十分待たされてる分、十分お茶も冷めてるもの。そ、それは大丈夫です。冷めてはおりませんので。<笑> Natsushi's irritation was obvious by now. The ineptitude that awaited the tea, the clumsiness of the servants, everything pointed to the incompetence of Natsushi's everyday leadership, making her lose face. As the person in charge of the Yushu 
<clears throat> Ushiro Mira family, the head family's kitchen, allowing that clumsiness to be exposed. Today of all days was surely nothing less of total humiliation. Yoseyo Natsuhine-san, Sharon-chan datte ganbatte iru no ni ijime cha kawai sou da ze. Ijime te no ka imasu. Ii kaori ne. O cha no meigara o kiite mo ii ka shira. Etto... Kira was trying to be nice, hoping to cut through the tense mood. However, Shannon had embarrassed herself instead, darkening Natsushi's face in the room's mood. By this point, Eva was audibly giggling. Nani? Shannon-chan, jibun de ire teru mono ga nani ka mo wakara nai no? Dame yo! そんな安げなものを来客に振る舞っちゃ。ピュアサイナイト。こんなお茶じゃ銀のスプーンでもないと飲めないわよ。すすみません。すぐに用意を。ねえ、シャノンちゃん。銀のスプーンって何に使うか
He might call it a clever move on his part, but there could be no doubt that it was a cowardly one. Plus Shannon on the bus. <laughs> Kenan's silence vividly expressed the distance between Shannon's words and how she actually felt. Suddenly, they both felt someone's presence in world round. A middle aged man stood there. Ah, it's, um, God, what was his name? It was Genji, yeah, the head servant. Shannon humbly obeyed and promptly made to push the cart and leave. However, Cannon peeled to Genji in silence, sparing something in his eyes that he could not express in words. シャ、シャノンは何も悪くないのに。あいつら。やめてかのんくん。失礼しました。すぐに仕事に戻ります。かのんくんも自分の持ち場に戻って。お願い。姉さんがそう言うなら。何事もないならそうしなさい。はい。
like, now we got, like, three perspectives here. We got the whole, you know, cousins going to each other. Then we got the, you know, parents. Now we got the servants themselves, and who knows how many there are there. I'm very curious on how Ryukushi 07 is going to balance all of them out. Because in a lot of big cash shows like Take the Walking Dead, there are just some characters that are there, but you don't really, you know, care about. So I'm very curious on how he's going to handle it. But before we continue on, let me check the characters. I knew I was going to check at the end, but... Oh, well, I guess they just not appear there. <laughs> or, unless I'm just missing something. No, doesn't seem like I am. Okay. The four of us cousins were enjoying our story stories, just shooting the blues. Anyway, there were both girls and guys here, plus we had people over a wide spread of ages, adult, high school, and elementary school. Even if we just talked about our own lives, the other three kept listening attentively. Attentively? Something <laughs> こうした話をしているうちに中身はあの頃から何も変わってないことが分かったぜ。同じ言葉を返してやるよ。バートラだって<笑> マリアだっていつまでもお子様じゃねえぞ。お子様から可愛いお姫様に成長していくんだからな。どうしたら、まな板みてえな群れもすぐ弟子金身になるぞ。そしたら、もませてくれよ。約束だぞ。ガッダム
っかり美人になったじゃねえのよももったいないお言葉強烈に存じますしかしよこの島じゃよっぽど食事の栄養価が高いんじゃねえのか何を食ってどこを鍛えたらそんなにでっかいお胸になるんだかジェシカとどっちがでけえかちょいと触って確かめさせてもらうぜ With both, <laughs> with both hands poised and swipe a dribbling from my mouth, I closed in. For the sake of justice and my personal honor, I'd like to point out that I don't suffer from some strange disease that makes my wimp nodes itch until I scratch my neck open, and which can only be prevented by fondling. <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> this is just a better or style method of communication. If I slowly close in on her like this, odds are eight or nine out of ten that I get swept or clobbered, will I? So I could use this battle where some original technique to spark a gag like that and break the ice. Well, it also means I really did get to touch them on that one in ten chance, though, right? <laughs> like that ever happen. At that point, my hands were. <laughs> At, at that point, my my hands were less than a centimeter away from Jack Chan's boobs, but the counter strike had yet to come. She blushed and lowered her head in embarrassment, which she realized what was going on. As she just stood there with both hands, what we joined in front of her, that even tried her sister cover her breasts. Best visual novel of all time, huh, guys? <laughs> God damn, I know Igarashi was perverted in some fucking, you know, aspects, but come on. Whoa, I wasn't planning on this. P -p Please hit me right now, I'm seriously going to- And there's Jessica. Which is why I was glad that Jessica chose that time to drive her elbow into the back of my head, yeah. Jessica, <laughs> <laughs> Bad Lord knew the gag was going to come in. He knows this joke already. Oh. Over a million anime have done it. いやいや、すまんぜ、シャノンちゃん。魅力的な胸に思わず吸着されそうになっちまった。つうか、さすがにあの間合いまで来たら犯罪確定だる。ダメだぜ。抵抗しなきゃよ。で、ですけど、バト
Chen and Chen announces while bowing arrogantly. Her expression was radiant. I gave her a thumbs up to show her I was fine with that. ついでにお手伝いみたいな印象だったんだけど。すっかり一人前の使用人さんだな。今年で何年になるんだ？はい。おかげさまで10年ほどお使いさせていただいております。Ten years. She's the kanji for her name or what a Shannon. Now here's another name that's far from typical for a Japanese person. Oh, when that noise happens, does the character appear? Yes, they do. Good to know. All right, Shannon, a young but experienced servant. She normally she's normally calm and performs her job flawlessly, but she messes up when she gets nervous. Furthermore, Shannon's nothing more than a pseudonym that she uses when on duty, not her real name. Ooh, okay. Back in the day, I was a kid myself, so I accepted her name without paying much attention. Thinking about it now, though, her name's pretty unusual, even though she's not a member of the Ushu Wom <clears throat> Ushi Wo. <clears throat> Ushiwo Mira family. Ushiwo Mira family. Ushiwo Mira family. Maybe it's like a servant's professional name or something. If so, that might explain why her name's so similar to Ken Kun, that kid I met early in the Rose Garden. She's a long term servant who served here since she was six years old. Jeez. Her appearance had changed so much that I couldn't match her to the person in my memories, but we both knew each other six years ago. That shy part of her had always been there, but she did seem to have developed a war you expect of a girl her age. Especially in her puss. Yes. Ah. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> so she's the daughter of the Kanon. カノン君がご迷惑をおかけしたようで申し訳ございません。別に迷惑なんか何も。同じ男として分かるさ。あれ、愛想が悪いのは当たり前だぜ。ガッデムホルモンズ。はい。マリアもよく言われる。愛想
According to Jessica, midwinter was especially tough with, with all the giraffes. Haven't these people ever heard of a Kodetasu? Kind of big, big old doors. As we entered the entrance hall, an aged servant greeted us. Now him, I remembered. Genji-san, who had been working here longer than anyone, filled the wall, wall of head servant. I mean, crook. Genji. Head servant, reading all the other servants who work for the Ushiwomira family, has served Kinzo longer than any other and has earned his greatest trust. Since he serves Kinzo directly, Qualis and Natsu, she think of him as Kinzo's spy. Hmm. As our eyes met, he greeted me with a calm, composed voice. His bow, bow wasn't as graceful, graceful or refined as Goda's, but despite its simplicity, it communicated his feelings very well. Genji, バトラ様こそご立派になられました。親方様の若き日に少し似てこられましたな。なおや。俺がじい様に<笑> Shannon Chan bowed deeply and watched us weave. After that, we headed towards the dining room under Genji san's guidance. Genji san, just like Kumasawa san, stood in stark contrast to us young people who had grown beyond recognition over the last six years. His appearance was exactly the same as in my memory some six years ago. It was as though time had stopped since the last time we met. Genji san was an extremely quiet and diligent person. He was basically grandfather's close aide or a caregiver, and you might even call him grandfather's companion of many years. In fact, it seems he was by grandfather's side even more often than my great grandmother was. Uh, according to Jessica, grandfather trusted him more than any of his blood relatives. Well, but I wonder how long he served. I never got the details, but I heard something about him being here since the very beginning when this mansion was first constructed. Damn which would mean that he's dedicated half of his life to serving here. It's easy to see why he's so trusted. As we passed through a massive hall that extended up into the second story of the mansion with no separating floor, I spotted something that hadn't existed in my memory of six years ago. This goddamn painting. Jesus fucking huge. It was an awfully big portrait hanging right in front of the stairs that rose to the second floor. Without thinking, I stopped walking, walking, captivated by it. Since we stopped so fast, Maria, who was falling behind me, ran to my back. I pointed at the big, prominently displayed portrait on the hall. Everyone else stopped too. Ah, so. Butler got killed at that time. Was it was not painted when? When was it? I think if my memory serves me right, it was in the middle of the year. Thank you. Yes, it was. It was in the spring of last year. 親方様が兼ねており画家に命じて描かせていたものをあそこに展示なされたのでございますあのじいさまがねわざわざ描かせておくわ。The portrait suited the western mansion. That woman in the elegant dress gave off a sense of refinement. I couldn't have guessed her age, but her sharp eyes and the strong will she seemed to possess made her look youthful. She seems somehow different from the composed, middle-aged women you often see in famous pictures. 
If she hadn't had normal black hair, I might have assumed it was a portrait of my long-deceased grandmother in her prime. Ooh, okay. However, she had beautiful blonde hair and didn't look Japanese at all. So it isn't the grandmother. Maria answered that simple question enthusiastically, as though proud she knew the answer. Beatrice. By Beatrice. I think I already said this, but Wokenjima is a small island only 10 kilometers in circumference. However, that actually that's actually pretty massive considering that only the Ushi well, <clears throat> Ushiro Mira family lives here. So only the harbor and the area around the mansion were set up to be lived in. Beyond that, the island remained as untouched as it as when it was uninhabited. The vast and empty forest had absolutely no lights, phones, or people passing through. To understand how dangerous that is, you need to forget your common sense as a city dweller. After all, if you happen to fall down a hole in the depths of the forest and sprain your ankle, no one would come save you no matter how much you cried or screamed. Then, once the sun went down, the forest would be warped in complete darkness since there were no street lights. And since there were no signs, it'd be easy to get lost and confused, losing your sense of direction inside that dark forest. Nowadays, most people see a forest as a peaceful place. But to the people of bygone eras, before the white of civilization drove out the night, forests were as geographically separated from civilization as the sea. They were oceans above the ground. Fishermen would go out into the ocean or putting their lives at risk, despite their technical knowledge. In the same way, hunters who go out to the forest are in danger, despite having specialized knowledge of their own. If children were to go play in such a dangerous forest, something terrible might happen. Someone's parents must have thought so too. Maybe grandmother first said it, or maybe it was grandfather himself. Or perhaps the story's been passed down on the, uh, this island since ancient times. There's a terrible witch in the forest, so you must not go in. Oh. Kind of like Baba Yaga. At some point, this ghost story of Wokenjima was born. This is the legend of Wokenjima's witch. That's right, when we talk about a witch on the island, we're referring to the master of that vast and savage forest. Come to think of it, when I stayed at this mansion as a little kid, during those eerie nights when the wind and rain pounded on the windows, I remember being terrified by a story of the forest witch who roamed around searching for human sacrifices. So Beatrice, huh? I know it's Italian, it's supposed to be the Italian pronunciation, but I'm going to fuck it up no matter what, so I'm just going to go with the English one. <laughs> When Anaki mentioned it, I searched my memory and was sure I recalled hearing a name like that when I was little. なるほどな。しかし、あの魔女伝説の魔女にベアトリーチェなんておしゃれな名前がついてたとはとんと忘れてたぜ。じいさんなみ。孫たちが信じないもんだからわざわざ絵に描き上がったか。well, Kenzo in the beginning was screaming out of how Beatrice was invisible and hiding away from him, so he has some connection to this so-called fictional witch. Jesus,魔女だよ。この絵を掲げた頃から現実と幻想の区別がつかなくなり始めた。うわ。私たちにとってはそう像の中の魔女に過ぎないけど、Jesus,魔女にとっては。彼女はこの島にいる存在。うん。いる。だからそれを理解することができない私たちにもわかるよ。あの絵を描かせたって言うんだけど。気持ち悪いったらありゃしないぜ。お嬢様、親方様にとっては大切な肖像画です。親方様
and only a small portion of this island was controlled by the Ushiro, Ushiro Mira family. All of the Wallace remainder was the domain of the witch, Beatrice. You might even call her the true ruler of Wokenjima. I felt a faint revival of that unsettling sense of misfortune which I'd felt when I learned of the true Tudukwe God's shrine being struck by lightning. And I remember that Kumasawa-san tried to tell an ominous story about Wokojima before Jessica stopped her. I don't know what she was planning to tell us about the silent, but I do know one thing. It isn't the Yushiro well, Mira family that rules Wokojima. It's the witch, Beatrice. That's right. After all, this is the witch's island. When I looked around, everyone was already heading towards the dining room. I heard a way chase after them. Hmm. Foreboding. We walked up to the huge double doors that led to the dining room. Genji-san knocked. The doors were opened, and we were invited inside. The dining room, which looked exactly like you imagine a rich person's dining room to be, had a super long table that was obviously positioned with no purpose other than to make the guests con conscious of their wank. Yep. Her parents were already sitting in accordance with that ordering. The old bastard pressed us to sit. The only gaps in that group of people were the spots where we were supposed to sit, which only made us feel our tardiness all the more. The seat at the head of the table, called the in Incipitance Chair, was for the most highly weight, reserved for Grandfather. It was still empty. He probably wanted to show up last for a dramatic effect, of course. Or show up dead. From the perspective of someone facing the Incipitance Chair head-on, the seating order went from left to right, with the lower-ranking seats progressing in rows of two further away from it. So the left-hand side of the first row, closest to the Incipitance Chair, <clears throat> Incipent's chair was where Uncle Klaus should have sat since he was the second highest in rank. It looked like he hadn't arrived yet, so that seat was empty. As across from his chair, on the white side of the first row, sat, sat the eldest daughter of the family, Aunt Eva, who was the third highest in rank. The left hand side of the second row was for the fourth highest in rank. There sat my damn dad, Rudolph, the third of the siblings. Across from him on the right side of the second row sat Aunt Rosa, the youngest sibling. At this point, you might expect their husbands and wives to come next. But nope, the left hand seat in the third row, rank number six, belonged to Jessica. Opposite her was George Anarchy. I sat next to Jessica, and Maria sat across from me. Then finally, next to me on the left-hand side of the fifth wall, sat Aunt Natsushi, the tenth highest in rank. Interesting. Opposite her was Uncle Hideyoshi. Next to Aunt Natsushi, in the sixth row and the final seat on the left side, sat Kirei-san. Okay, so Natsushi isn't... she was married into the family. Yeah, yeah, yeah that makes sense. The seat opposite to Kirei-san was empty, even though silverware had been set there and everything. It Actually... It's very interesting that Natsushi was married into the family because she's the most kind of, oh no, courteous, more, no, not curious, no, I, yeah, I guess that would be the word, more conscious of her rank, maybe because of her, yeah, complex. The seat opposite to Kiri-san was empty, even though silverware had been sat there and everything. According to this high winking to this winking system, that spot was where Aunt Loza's husband should be sitting. Even though he wasn't supposed to be coming, his place was made up. Ooh. Interesting. Normally winking systems of this sort give spouses equal positions as their partners, but the Yushiwo Mira family system was unique. Maybe it's a remnant of male chavalism. 
If you start with the assumption that a woman's womb is just something to be borrowed, the children of the direct descended would come first, directly followed by the grandchildren. In other words, spouses have no blood ties and are therefore placed at the end of the line. Yeah, that's what I guessed. It's terrible, but by this system, my grandmother would be ranked even lower than me. Jeez, she was still alive. In their youth, they obeyed their father after they had married their husband after aging their children. There's the old saying, women have no home within in any realm. Long ago, when I was still incapable of figuring all this out, I thought it was so great that we could all chat in our little groups, adult siblings with adult siblings and cousins with cousins. However, now that I can re-examine the seating order after growing up a bit, it serves up some very complicated feelings in me. Yeah, no kidding. Ah, Natsushi, who was married to the eldest son and was the de, de facto number two in managing this family, sat to my right. Which meant that she was two steps lower than me in the ranking order. It was hard to imagine what might be going on inside her heart. That's why I made a small apologetic gesture towards her before sitting down. I guess that's why she's trying to be... Gain the most face. Be the most... I don't know. Courteous. I mean, heck, even in her fashion choice, it's very conservative, very, um, 1800s, you know, Europe, European. That's her short pause, she did laugh with me, but it seems she couldn't quite figure out what she was supposed to be laughing at. This woman is on Natsushi. Okay, now we got the character. Cross's wife manages the household of the Ushu <clears throat> Ushiro Mira head family in place of her husband, who takes little interest for his, this family confluence again. She was the one who took charge of making all the preparations and arrangements, possesses a strong sense of responsibility and a great deal of pride. However, neither her husband nor his siblings understand her very well, so her position is far from en enviable. Jeez. She's the wife of the eldest son of the family, meaning she's my father's older brother's wife. Is it simpler if I just call her Jessica's mother? Yeah. It feels bad to say it like this, but while I didn't exactly dislike her, I didn't particularly like her either. She's hardly ever spoke with us kids, and all of my memories of her invoke, invoke, involve her talking to the adults about complicated things with a scary look on her face. In fact, since we hardly ever exchanged words, I spent a long time trying to figure out how I should approach her. Though, my efforts seem to have ended in failure. The silverware sat neatly on the table, but the meal itself hadn't been brought in yet. As a general rule, you couldn't start a meal until the person sitting at the head of the table arrived. Yeah. So as long as grandfather didn't come, lunch would be put on hold indefinitely. Not even the appetizers would arrive. Some way put, the silence in this room was caused by our parents enduring their hunger while they waited for grandfather to arrive. However, the grandfather from my memories would always show up on time to meals like this. He was the kind of person who would never be so late that it kept everyone waiting, especially after the entire group had arrived. Oh,せえな、じいさま。俺の記憶じゃ、時間に厳格な人だったと思うんだけどな。まあ、6年前はそうだったかもな。最近はそうでもねえよ。というか… もう自分の世界オンリーって感じで、会食にも顔を出さねえぜ。さすがに今日くらいは足並みを揃えてくれるって思ってたんだけどな。まあ、私は来ない方が気楽で嬉しいけどよ。ジェシカ。When her mother scolded her, Jessica stuck her tongue out and looked away. No way around it. Might as well wait until our host arrives. When I glanced at the clock, I saw that it was almost 12.20. Hmm. Alright, here we go. Ushiro 
Ushuo Miro Kinzo, the aged family head of the Ushuo Miro head family. Let's go ahead and look at his character. Big grandfather. The aged head of the Ushuo Mira family, brimming with energy despite being pronounced to have only a short time left to live, amassed a vast fortune, but has never made any announcements about his inheritance, which worries his children. Strongly influenced by the West and a rabid fan of the occult, his study is packed with mysterious grimoires. Hmm. This man could be seen in his study. The clock had already passed noon, but he didn't even attempt to rise from his seat. With his spectacles on, he built up a growing pile of books with elaborate bindings, which he then read intently. You couldn't really say that he was having too much fun to stop, whether he filled the room with a sense of impatience, or perhaps a sense of impending danger, as though every second wasted was a tragedy. In this sealed room, a dense dust danced through the air which was thick with the stench of chemicals that excluded, excluded a mix of suspicious odors. Those odors were somehow sweet and heavy. If anyone with a normal nose, nose came in here, the first thing they'd do would be to open a window and ventilate the room. The no knocking against the study door had been going on for a while, Genzi. A voice calling father sometimes mingled with the knocks. Or, no? No, probably, uh, cross. As Kinzo heaved a deep sigh, he snapped shut the old book in his hands and slammed it on the table. Then he yelled at Cross, who was still knocking on the door. Also, I, I haven't mentioned this, but I love the, uh, this, like, character designs in this game. I think they're, like, just awesome. And honestly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind if I cosplayed as one of them, because I'm a f big fan of suits and ties. <laughs> Oh, and also, someone, like, told me that, uh, Ryu Kishio 7 basically, uh, analyzed a bunch of fashion, like, magazines in order to prepare for this game, which is kind of the same method Awaki uses with Jojo, which I also love. Cross called out to his father through the door. Kinzo always shut himself up in the study, hating it when any nearly anyone, even his family, entered the room. For that reason, Qualis had no choice but to call to him from the corridor like this. Jeez. <laughs> Also, speaking of uh, similarities, Genji did mention that Battle reminded him of uh, Kinzo younger. He has the exact same suit on. He has the red, like, he's got the white suit, and he's got the white uh, undershirt. I mean, no. White overshirt, red undershirt shirt, I think. I don't know. I don't fucking know fashion. <laughs> Yeah, he's truly gone into his own little world. On the other side of the door, Kraus, Nanjo, and Genji kept waiting for the master of the house, who suddenly refused to come out. <laughs> oh my god, it's Saul Goodman! <laughs> if this guy doesn't turn out to be evil, I would be fucking surprised. Look at that face. <laughs> Kraus shrugged as though saying it's no use and smiled bitboy. From the beginning, he hadn't really expected his father to respond to his calls. 
However, since it was the duty of the eldest son, he had tried his forward malady. I am trying to read my magical girl manga, god damn it! I don't care for my family. <笑>さあ急ぎ、すぐに呼べ。時間は常に有限だ。人たちはすでにラッパを構えているぞ。Damn, the apostles are wearing their trumpets. Kinzo swammed an old heavy book against the table over and over. That wacky quill expressed his great displeasure. Kinzo put his spectacles down and flew up from his chair. He spread his arms wide open as if to sing to a packed opera house, as if appealing to someone, and yelled. なぜだ。なぜにいつも私には世界中から美少を奪い取り、全てをお前に捧げよう。おお、いなものの軍艦長たちよ。世界中から美少を刈り取り収穫せ。ぐぐ。ぐぐ。ああ。ぐ。ジ
Genji watched him leave and knocked on the study door. Oyakata-sama, Genji de gozaimasu. Genji ka? Nani yue watashi wo kore koto ni matasu no ka? Soko ni wa dare mo orumai na. Hai, watashi dake de gozaimasu. Kenzo returned to his seat in the city and pressed an old-fashioned switch in the table. After a small delay, the heavy sound of the door and walking could be heard. Jeez. Kenzo was convinced that his family wanted to make a mess of his study. Or perhaps one had once opened the window for some air and ended up gathering things that to him were important research materials, leaving them in a terrible mood. Kenzo had outfitted the room with a formidable lock, preventing anyone from entering without his permission, and thereby sealing himself in a jail of his own making. Genji, whom he trusted the most, was relatively free to enter the room, but even that didn't always hold. If Kenzo was in a bad mood, even Genji wouldn't be able to enter. Anyone else would be limited to holding a conversation through the door, unable even to see Kenzo's face. Most of the time, what they could could God could hardly be called a conversation. However, this then troubled the rest of the family much. After all, it just wasn't worth the effort to disturb this aging family head who was impossible to please and always stayed shut away, immersed in this research. Taking advantage of his refusal to leave his room, they supported his isolation, putting his care entirely into the hands of the servants. Genji. Genji headed to a corner of the city. There, suspicious looking bottles boasting venomous colors were on display. They were actually wicker, but considering the shady atmosphere of this room, one might easily suspect them of being some ghastly poison. Inside the study, the mysterious collection of books gathered by Kinzo had grown into a mountain. They were bizarre ancient or banned books, all of them either forbidden, cursed, or sealed. But if you tried to call them old books, Kinzo would fly into a rage and call, say, Call them grimoires! They were also many mysterious objects that presumably held some meaning with regards to black magic, like candles suspiciously melted and molded into strange shapes. The constellations drawn on a certain celestial globe contained quite a few shapes that would draw puzzled looks from anyone familiar with today's night sky. The carelessly strewn about books contained many illustrations, all of them of a religious or mysterious nature, including some de depicting demonically grotesque subjects or bizarre diagrams of various magic circles. And above all, a sweet poisonous smell filled the room, profoundly salting the eyes and noses of those who entered for the first time. Eventually, it must surely make a person go numb and lose their grip on reality. Inside that city, Genji prepared Kenzo's usual drink with a well-trained hand. No one would even think of drinking such an ominous dark green liquid in that complex and ornate glass, unless someone first told them it was alcohol. He poured a little into the glass. Then, he placed a cube of sugar in a strangely shaped spoon and poured water from a pitcher over it. Strangely, when the transparent water was poured, the dark green liquid turned to cloudy, cloudy white. It was a strange optical illusion, as though the water had caused a chemical reaction and made the drink become even more unrecognizable as wicker. Then, Genji added original flavors Kinzo loved, fine-tuning his taste. There was no recipe. Its success was measured only by Kinzo's mood swings when he drank it, and it had taken Genji many decades to learn how to do it right. Genji placed the glass on a tray and walked over to Kinzo. By this time, Kinzo was gazing out the window. I kinda... It's so interesting, I feel bad for Kinzo. Like, it's either one or two things. One... He's just an old man who's going to die soon, and now he's going into these delusions of this fictional witch named Beatrice calling out for her, crying for her name in his madness. Kind of like uh, 
kind of like dementia, slowly losing, losing himself in the process, devolving into a mess of a person. Or two, <clears throat> voice crack, or two, he's telling the truth. <laughs> Which, uh, <laughs> that'd be bad, and we know for a fact supernatural things can happen in this universe. We just played Igarashi, so I wouldn't count it out. I will not count it out. Kenzo had regained his composure. It was now unrecognizable as a shouting, screaming, yelling man from a few moments ago. Looking at this man from behind as he tilted his glass and gazed down at the scenery beyond the window, he projected a sense of dignity and intelligence to allow Kenzo to set his glass down at any time. Genji motionlessly waited behind Kenzo and to his left, as though he were a living sideboard. Then, without averting his eyes from the window, Kenzo held out his glass. There was only a mouthful remaining. It was not a gesture intended to set it upon the tray, but a motion to hand the glass over to Genji. Genji respectfully received the glass and inclined it a little to taste its contents. After that, he gulped it down. <laughs> Kenzo smiled at his royal subject, who refused to put aside rank, even when asked to. However, he was not making fun of him. His smile was relaxed, as though chuckling at a close friend's old, unshakable habit. <laughs> Kenzo gave a faint smile, as if to say he didn't need any fried away. Kenzo <laughs> Mm, interesting. I mean, it's not wrong. Klaus no あやつは私を鶏か何かだと思っておる。死んだらガラにして出しまで取る気だ。ルドルフの間抜けは女遊びばかり。ローザはどこの馬の骨とも分からん男の赤ん坊など海を追って。ジェシカは無能で無学だ
。逃がさぬ、逃がさぬ、逃がさぬ、逃がさぬ。He has this infatuation with this Beatrice. お前は私のものだ。常に私の腕の中でなくてはならん。私の生涯のすべてなのだ。我が鳥かごにて永遠に私に私だけに囁き続けるのだ。ベアトリーチ。Jeez. なぜに微笑み返してはくれぬ。おお。ベアトリー。After howling, Kinzo choked once again. Genji set the cherry and glass down and rubbed his bastard's back. Genji's facial expression did not change. It was always like this. <laughs> When his seemingly deranged fit subsided, Kinzo regained his composure once again. It was like seeing two different people, a wild Kinzo and a composed Kinzo, living together inside one body. Yuini, I was convinced. This way, boyaki kitta yose o taiman ni sumosu koto nado, mohaya taerare wa sen. Kono mi ni saigo ni tosuru coin ga aru nara ba, sore wo akuma tachi no rule. とに託してみたい。魔法の力はいつもかけるリスクで決まる。日本古来の呪術である牛の国参りがそうであろう。七日間、儀式を目撃されてはならないというリスクを支払うからこそ、魔力が宿る。困難なリスクが生じれば生じるほどに魔力は強く生じるのだ。神話に登場する数々の奇跡は天文学的リスクに奇跡的な低確率を得て成就した驚愕すべき魔力の結晶なのだと言える。モーゼが海を割ったのは神の奇跡ではない。蹂躙の計りに乗せられ、軍勢によって航海に追い詰められた絶対絶命のリスクが奇跡の魔力を生んだのだ。同じことが同じ規模で繰り返されようとも、再び海が割れることはないだろう。なぜならモーゼは力ある者たちのルーレットの阿蘇義。ナユタをかけたよりも多く存在する目の中に一つだけ刻まれた奇跡を見事引き寄せることができたからだ。その天文学的確率に勝利できる力。そう奇跡を掴み取る運気はすなわち魔力なのだ。強大な魔力を得るためには絶望的なリスクを背負わねばならぬ。魔力もたぬものはそれを賭けでなく自暴自棄と呼ぼう。しかし、真に魔力あるものはその奇跡を掴み取り、神秘を成就させるのだ。Hmm. もしも私にその魔力があるならば。私はその奇跡を掴み取るだろう。生涯を費やした願いを実現できるだろう。Kenzo looked up to the sky outside the window. He spread his arms as if appealing to someone up in the skies. もし私にその奇跡を手にする資格があったなら、お。Beatrice, Beatrice. 
once again. Many mentions of miracles and roulettes and bets. Everything. His nonsensical yells became a scream and then a wail. Kinzo swamped to the floor, tearing at it with both hands. Genji had no choice but to ruthlessly watch over his master's lamentations. <sighs> Jeez. Yeah, Sokum. Toshu Sama wo guai ga sugure rare nai to no koto da. Sekkaku kou shite 1 nen buri no kaimo ni atsumatte kureta Sokun to chushoku o tomo ni dekinai koto wo hijou ni zanmen ni shite orareta. ゴード、ランチを始めてくれ。つける薬がありませんので。おいおい、機嫌ってまたかよ。そりゃないぜ。こちら、秋のクソ忙しい時期にスケジュール都合してご機嫌伺いに来てるんだ。それはよ。よかったじゃないか、ルドルフ。ご
So, in um, Kinzo's delusions, or actual reality, we still don't know, still don't know yet, they keep saying the Ushiwo, o, Ushiwo Mira family was about to be, like, forgotten and destroyed, but it seemed like Kinzo had brought it back to prosperity. So it seems like he made this deal with the witch, Beatrice, in which he rebuilt the Ushi Oshiro Mira family. But what was the deal? That's what I'm curious about. Even though they were beginning the meal with that seat still empty, no one felt it was that odd anymore. <laughs> what a way to end, huh? <laughs> The Ushiro Mira Family Conference was held once every year on the first weekend of October. If a normal family were to hold, hold a so-called family conference, you expect it to be nothing more than a reunion of rarely seen relatives who greet each other around buckets of sushi or something. However, part of the family's great fortune had been lent out to grandfather's children, and no one in this family was considered an adult until they had met with success in business. So this meeting literally was a conference. How much of the fortune was invested? What sort of business was conducted? How much profit was earned? As a result, how much of the fortune borrowed from the main family could be repaid? Or possibly how much more would be borrowed for future business ventures? What lessons had they learned and what could they learn from their mistakes? It seemed that topics like these were discussed very seriously in the past. My dad said it was like lying on the bed of nails, lying. Appearing what used to be a very serious family meeting where people were bathed in scornful and angry voices and some people even got swept despite their age. However, that had become a thing of the past. Now with everyone pursuing their own business ventures and achieving success, it was becoming more of a normal yearly get-together. Even so, telling grandfather about recent events was extremely stressful. So, while it was nothing more than a simple get-together for us grandchildren, it was still a real stomach ache for our parents. The absence of the man who was the source of all this trouble, regardless of the reason, probably made today's lunch taste much more delicious. The phrase, while the demon is not around, everyone can relax, comes to mind. Anyway, what's introduced Jessica's father, whose face I haven't seen for six years? The man sitting to my father's left is his older brother and Jessica's father, uncle. This name surely is easy to weed. Klaus. Now that we've gotten used to this string of weird names, our perspective is totally skewed. So Klaus doesn't actually seem that bad. <laughs> yeah. Let's see, what, what do we got on you, Klaus? Kinzo's first child weeds the family conference as the eldest of the four siblings. However, the other siblings suspect that he plans to claim the entire family fortune himself for himself, and the antagonism between him and the others grows increasingly severe. A real estate investor, he has put a vast amount of money into the development of a resort. However, his results have been harshly criticized. Hmm. It even starts to sound kind of cool. Just like with on Nat Natsushi. I didn't have any memories of speaking with Uncle Klaus. He had never been one to chat with chil two children. I felt like he was always talking with the adults, just like on Not Sushi. Not Sushi. According to my father's gossip, he was a spiteful and violent man. If what he said is true, Uncle Klaus used to be very domineering from his position as the oldest sibling, and was despised by all the other siblings. Though, despite that, those siblings all seem to be chatting happily together. Oh well, even if their relationship was bad when they were children, sometimes when people grow up and live apart from each other, their relationship change. That's probably what this was. After all, they all had children about the same age. By sharing the same family environment, they probably profited by exchanging opinions. Maybe because of that, a short while ago, the circle of parents began to discuss the exams Jessica and I would be taking. Jessica, in order to escape questions about exams from my father on their left, purposely faced right while firing off a, off a rapid series of comments, not giving him any chance to get a word in. Moving on, let's look at the end opposite from Klaus and the others. 
At the very last seat at the table, an old gentleman with a sturdy physique sat facing Kurisan. This was my first time meeting him. I had only just been introduced to him, but it seems he's grandfather's personal doctor, a man called Nan Nanjo. Nanjo? Nanjo. I already used to own a huge clinic on the nearby island of N Nijima, but he turned it over to his son and began living a life of leisure in his old age. He had known grandfather since the very beginning when the mansion was first constructed on this island and had built up a relationship over several decades. I thought at first that the two of them might have gotten to know each other through grandfather's suspicious hobbies, but it seems he was actually grandfather's chess partner. Uh, I see. That kind of hobby seems very like our grandfather, what with his love of all things Russian. Nanjo is probably the only person who could enter Wokenjima despite being neither a family member nor a servant. Hmm. Ch -ch -ch -ch. Where's Nanjo? There he is. Kinzo is a attending physician and longtime friend. Once ran a hospital in Nijima, but now turned it over to his son and now enjoys his old age in peace. One of the very few people that Kinzo trusts now that he is held captive by an unwelling suspicion of others. Big hearted by nature, he has maintained a long friendship with Kinzo, unperturbed by his tendency to fly into rage at the slightest provocation. Hmm. He looked like a calm old gentleman as he listened to the discussion between Kyrie and the other women who sat near him. Considering how long he stayed by the side of our short-tempered grandfather, his generous heart was probably nothing to laugh at. Still, even if he was a family doctor, having anyone outside the Ushiro-Mira Ushiro family attended the family confluence was a little odd. It made me think that Grandfather's condition might have worsened so much it'd be a major topic of discussion at today's conference. After all, George said something like that just a second ago. Something about how we've been getting continuous reports since around last year that Grandfather didn't have long to live. It's nasty to think about it, but considering consider how rich Grandfather is. At the time of his death, his wealth will suddenly be released probably along with a fair share of our parents' stomach acid. You know, we two ulcers for everyone, yep. After all, this sort of thing just gets messier when there's more wealth to be divided. There's a good chance they'll be talking about stuff like that at the family confluence. Still, it's not like it's got anything to do with us kids. Finally, even though he hasn't shown up, let me introduce our grandfather. The person who should be sitting in that incipitant's chair is Ushuo Mira Kenzo. It always sucks. Everyone else in the family has these weird names, but he's got this perfectly normal one for himself. If only his name was one Kenzo, and but he he let us call him Goldsmith or something. <laughs> I totally freak out. As you can probably guess by now, he's a frightening person with an extremely short temper. If I'm one of his grandchildren, not a son, and I haven't seen him since elementary school. Thanks to that, I have no memory of being beaten myself, but our parents were apparently raised with an iron fist. Mm. The earlier conversation between my dad and Uncle Klaus about who should go convince Grandfather to come down seems pretty darn funny once you know their background. Hmm. You can't really tell tell Grandfather's story without covering that pivotal event back before the show era. Event, huh? Until the Meiji and Tashiro eras, the Ushiro Mira family was great and prosperous. Prosperous. Interesting. They owned several spinning mills, making them rich enough to just double over, laughing every day as the money kept rolling in. Incidentally, Grandfather was a member of, the, of a branch family and had pretty much nothing to do with the main family. Not only was he weighed down the list of people who could inherit the headship, but he had hardly any contact with the Grandma's main family. However, during the Great Kanto earthquake in 1923, the mansion owned by the Ushuo Mira family in Odawawa was flattered. The spinning mills in Tokyo were all burned down in a huge fire, and the Ushuo Mira family lost most of its wealth and family members in an instant. Huh. So once they started trying to figure out who the successor to the Ushuo Mira family should be, they apparently found no one remaining except Kenzo and the Blanche family. In Kenzo's witty waiter reminiscence, he referred to this as a good fortune so great that it overturned fate. Ooh. With that, Grandfather 
father, fa ugh, grandfather's boring everyday life did a 180. He was entrusted with reviving the dying Ushiwo Mira family, which had lost nearly all of its wealth. However, just because he had been entrusted with this task didn't mean he could accomplish, mu accomplish it. Apparently, those around him weren't really expecting much. However, this is when Grandfather began displaying his extraordinary talent and good luck. Grandfather used all of the family's remaining wealth, as well as everything from the hair on his head to his tornails as collateral in order to borrow a massive amount of money. Once he built up a gigantic war chest, he immediately invested in businesses. It was like someone tumbling down a hill on a bike without any brakes, and then jumping onto a neighboring bike and then another one. Just like some crazy street performance. I'll bet everyone fought Grandfather had no business ability whatsoever. However, after, after several miracles and turns of good luck with coincidences piling up and every chance taking advantage of, he was suddenly in control of powerful connections with the occupying forces. At that time, MacArthur and the GHQ were the ultimate authority in Japan. Grandfather and Twinkle of an Eye began succeeding in business under the protection of the occupying forces, quickly becoming very rich. And by this point, it's probably safe to say that information, not luck, saved the day. He must have made some seriously deep connections with the occupying forces. Grandfather knew beforehand about emergency demands that would be made for, for the North Korean War. Ooh. No, it was more than that. He must have predicted those emergency demands from the very beginning when he started investing in his money. The history books make it sound like all of Japan made a huge, large profit off the emergency demands during the Korean War, but that isn't actually true. Only a very limited number of the super rich played the money game and made an easy profit. Most of the citizens became remained poor. In other words, Grandfather was a member of this extremely lucky group of winners. I'm pretty sure this all happened during 1950 or so. The Great Kanto Earthquake happened in 1924 or so. That means Grandfather was able to revive the near-dead Ushiro Mira family in about 20 years to a level even higher than it had ever been before. Only 20 years, jeez. With that, you think he revived the main family in Odawawa. But for some reason, he went and did something as crazy as buying an entire small island in the Izu Archipelago. Buying an entire island is not something that you can ordinarily do today. However, Grandfather was clever. He contacted, contacted the GHQ and applied for the establishment of a marine resource base. He acquired this island as a business property and then tossed that project aside and claimed it as his own plot of land. After the war, there were prevention measures against food shortages and having the sponsorship of the GHQ meant that nobody could oppose him. From what I've heard, the Tokyo Metropolitan of that day offered this land to him pr practically for free. Later, Tokyo made difficulties by telling Kinzo to return the land, but the pushy GHQ intervened. Anyway, it seems under the table bribes did their work well. In the end, the city gave up in frustration. Grandfather, with considerable skill and good luck, managed to weather the stormy seas of that period, obtaining a vast fortune in his own island. Of course, it probably wasn't all luck. He was obsessed with all things Western, which helped him cultivate his English skills. He was able to use this to, advan to his advantage and sink his teeth into the GHQ. A mansion was built on the island soon after. This mansion, in fact. Grandfather, with his love of the western style, made this once uninhabited island a canvas upon which he could realize his dreams to his heart's content. He now had the western mansion of his dreams overflowing with emotion and an atmosphere, with a beautiful garden featuring all sorts of roses. And he had a private beach where nobody other than himself would would ever be permitted to leave a footprint. This would be a dream come true for any boy. After that, he made good use of his, his huge fortune, becoming a large stockholder in an extremely stable iron and steel industry and was able to leave an easy and comfortable life just using the dividends. Well, he's just that incredible. This kind of person usually has the ability to foresee and predict the future, at least that is how they portrayed that. They're portrayed after the fact. But Grandfather denies all of that, repeatedly saying that he was simply blessed with extraordinary luck, or granted it. 
Anyway, even a ward like that can't help but grow increasingly eccentric when, when locked up alone on an island, where all his dreams are made real. Everyone knows that he's had a Western obsession from the start, but none of the parents really know when his bizarre black magic hobby began. Did his love of black magic begin way back with when he became fascinated with everything Western? Or did his miraculous stretch of good luck while reviving his family cause him to feel mysterious power within itself? At some point, Grandfather began to make the research of black magic his wife's work. He filled his study up with suspicious books, chemicals, and magical items as he became increasingly bizarre. From what I've heard, those around him warmly watched over him, figuring that someone who had achieved success in life had a right to do as he pleased, but there's no way that's true. They were probably just creeped out, thinking that's disgusting, I don't want to get involved. Anyway, that agitated period was an age of big gambles with both opportunities and risks. Let's say Grandfather was born in this time period. He would have had no opportunities and would probably have advanced like a chess piece from mandatory education to college at a leisurely pace, never becoming more than an average salary man. If that happened, he'd probably have sat down somewhere, happily talking behind his boss's back. Boss's back. No, no, no. Not in a fancy dining hall like this, more like a table in some bar. Then again, I bet this family conference would be a whole lot more relaxing if that were the case. Huh. Interesting. Mm. So because of coincidences and good luck, he was able to become super rich, huh? Mm. And it was very much in line with the GHQ, which I have no idea what's about. I, I don't know, I, did, I never talked much about the Korean War. Um... So interesting, that's very interesting. Okay, that's enough about the old geezer. More important way, let's talk about this incredible lunch. Damn, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> After this, I gotta eat. Kouda-san,大した Everyone went out a big bluff. Damn it, you say that even though you love these those cheap pubs. Hahaha. <laughs> よくは知らねえんだけどよ。as Gilda removed his empty the empty plates, he began to recount his own bumpy past without losing a smile. しかし、そのおかげでこうして今日、後宮家で再び料理人として腕を振るう機会を賜ることができました。大勢の方の笑顔も嬉しいですが、お使いすると決めた限られた方々にだけ喜んでいただくために繊細なお仕事ができるのも
I guess it's true when they say well, you have another stomach for dessert. I thought I'd already filled up on the delicious food, but as soon as I weighed eyes on the dessert, my stomach, stomach started yelling more. I don't know much about desserts, but this looked really good. The white pudding-like substance was garnished with two shades of wet sauce, and the elegant rose petals adorned the dish. Normally, during a high-class meal like this, you're supposed to wait for the chef to extort the virtues of this particular meal before eating. However, Maria was completely indifferent to strict rules like that, so she got excited by this beautiful and delicious-looking dessert jumping into the fray as soon as it was placed before her. Yeah, Rosa scolded her, calling it bad manners, but George responded by saying, Now, now, it's okay. <laughs> Maria exclaimed as she sampled the two colored sauces. What? <laughs> Apparently, one sauce was sweet and the other sour. Despite it being bad manners, I stuck, stuck my little finger in and whipped it. Whoa, one of the sauces was sour enough to make you pucker up. If it were yellow, I expected lemon, but I couldn't guess what kind of sourness would be red. I decided to ask Shannon, who was putting away the serving cart behind us. Shannon-chan, <laughs> Chen and Chen hesitated to speak. Maybe her job was just to set the table so she didn't will doesn't really know. Still, even considering that, she seems pretty stressed. Maybe I shouldn't have asked. But did they use some green that we'd be we'd be better off not knowing about? Well, on Natsushi made a gesture <laughs> that seemed to indicate an uncoming headache, Kumasala san, who was sending the table at the opposite seat, began to chuckle. <笑>驚きますよ。Kumasawa-san weaned across from the other side of the table. I weaned forward myself when she asked. Their interest caught Jessica, George Aniki, and of course Maria also put their ears closer. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy, we all fought horrified. Only Maria accepted it, not in stage your way. <laughs> when Maria started crumbling that macaroni was sour, the adults were unable to contain their laughter. Whispered to Maria that Makaro is sour only once prepared as sh sh Shimasaba vine guard. Ah, now I totally remember. Kumasawa san was always like this, wasn't she? I think I remember her tricking me too in all sorts of ways when I was young. The most weeful has got to be that one. Those flimsy black things in Chinese dishes. They're cute. Cure guy mushrooms. She told me that they were penguin meat, and I went all around school like a smartass telling everyone, didn't I? Kumasa <laughs> 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 Goda looked a little put off about his masterpiece being laughed at for such a bizarre reason. But after clearing his fork, once he introduced the dessert to us. So, the dessert is a very good thing. I am 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 a very good 
散らしてございますバラの花びらは当家の庭園より先ほど採取してきたものでございますソースはストロベリーとローズヒップの2色の赤をご用意しましたストロベリーの甘味とローズヒップの酸味を交互にお楽しみになってくださいなお花びらは鑑賞用となっておりますので避けてからお召し上がりくださいませそれではどうぞお楽しみくださいわお、まあ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、ああ、This combination of sweet and sour is also exquisite. If it was just sweet, you'd just get used to it and b o r e d halfway through. But if you reach the sour sauce at that point, you get a really vivid taste. And then, once you return to the sweet sauce, all the sourness in your mouth would be replaced with enjoyable sweetness. I'm sure everyone else felt the same way. Every time g o d a s a n passed by one of our seats, someone poised the taste in his presentation. ありがとう。ほら言ったでしょ夏ひねさんローズヒップは頭痛に効くってみたいね効くといいんだけどああ郷田さんあんたには惚れるでなあ後であんたの待遇を聞かせてや無理ならあんたの欲しい年収指立ててくれるだけでもいいやであんたの腕がこの島だけで独占されとるのは人類の食文化に対する冒涜やその腕わしの会社で振るってお客の皆さんを喜ばせてみる気はないかのう<笑>秀吉さんうちのゴーダを引き抜かれるのですかこれは困ったゴーダの待遇をもっと良くしないと引き抜かれてしまいそうだ<笑>そうした方がいいわねじゃないと引き抜かれて三食が熊沢さんのサバ料理にされちゃうわよ<笑>これはこれは適義しゅうございますすっかり根に持たれてしまいまして<笑> Everyone let out a huge w a u g h According to Jessica, Kumasawa san's macro jokes were a running gag that her parents had long since come used to. Kumasawa san often claimed that mackerels had precious nutritional value, which could slow aging, make people smarter, and more. Ah, mackerels, man. Supposedly, while it couldn't stop the outward signs of aging, it helped prevent aging on the inside. Since she was still spirited enough to tell these kinds of jokes at her age, there must be something to that theory. <laughs> それでは失礼いたします。夕食にはふるってたくさんのサバ料理をお召し上がりいただきますのでどうぞご期待くださいませね。<笑>期待してるよ。今晩はしめサバでキュッとしゃれ込みたいぜ。それは素敵ね。ついでに日本酒の美味しいのも出てこないかしら。ええー、ございますよ。六軒島名物のサバ焼酎なるものがございまして。Kumasawa <laughs> 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 san, together with Shan and Chan, bowed and pushed the serving cart away. It was pretty funny to watch Goda san, who looked like the, his show had totally been stolen, explain in serious voice that we would be having calf steak for dinner. <laughs> あの、熊沢さんさっきはありがとうございました
As she pushed the serving car, Shannon bowed her head very deeply. <laughs> Kumasawa-san, Kumasawa may have played dumb, but she had obviously understood and saved Shannon in the nick of time. Back when Battle War had asked about dessert, Shannon unfortunately hesitated. There may have been several ways to dodge a question, but all of them would have required some quick wits. Shannon, who hesitated when hard pressed for a response, was always suffering because of this small weakness. If only Shannon had a little more whittle of the craftiness needed to cleverly shake off a mistake like Oda, her life would have been a bit easier. The fact that she could perform other tasks flawlessly made this weakness even more unfortunate. However, there were some who understood Shannon's honest nature, her inability to gloss over a mistake and draw attention away from it. That was why Kumasawa had smoothly come to her rescue. さん<笑> To Shannon, Kumasawa was a good mother among the servants. Oh, that's a cute relationship. I like that. Okay, guys. I think this is a good stopping point here. Uh, we quite, we weren't quite a bit of, um, information as how Kenzo, uh, rebuilt the U Ushi Ushiwo Mira family. And just got to know the characters a bit more. I think we've met the entire family by this point. Also, I've also heard that the, the character bios can update here and there, so. Eh, it doesn't look like it for right now. But, uh, yes, um, I hope you guys enjoy this type of content. If you did, hit that subscribe button. If you liked it, hit the like button. Want to tell me something? Put it down in the comments below. Want to check out the Discord server where I'm going in, or my Twitter. Check the description below. And yeah, this has been Boy Lego. I'll see you guys next time. See ya!